Hello everyone and welcome to Linden New Art's series of Meet the Artist sessions. The series introduces our current exhibiting artists and tonight we're talking to Troy Emery about his fantastic exhibition Sonda. You're joining us live on Facebook and YouTube and there'll be lots of opportunities to ask questions. So if you would like to ask a question or make a comment about the conversation, please use the chat or Q&A sections on your screen. My name's Juliet Hansen. I'm the curator here at Linden New Art and our events and community engagement coordinator, Linda Studina will be monitoring the chat and she'll pass on any questions to me that you have as we go along. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we all virtually meet this evening. Tonight, I'm joining you from Linden New Art, which is on the lands of the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. And Troy is joining us from the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And while we meet virtually this evening, tonight draws upon the ancient history of this land and reflects the millennia of experiences of First Nations people coming together to celebrate, to learn and to connect. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all First Nations people who are joining us this evening. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Troy Emery. Hello there, Hello. Troy. Hi. Hello, thank you very much for having me. It's such a pleasure. Uh, Troy is an artist based in Melbourne. He works primarily with textiles in a sculptural practice to produce animal-like forms. His artwork examines the discourse surrounding the delineation between fine arts and craft, as well as animals as both entrenched decorative motifs and tokens of ecological ruination. Troy has presented his work across Australia and internationally since 2003, and he's recently held solo exhibitions at the Art Gallery of Ballarat in 2019, Craft, and as part of Dark Mofo in 2018. Troy's work is held in various private and public collections, including the NGV, Art Bank, City of Townsville, Goulburn Regional Art Gallery, and Deakin Art Museum. Troy is represented by Martin Brown Contemporary in Sydney. So big welcome to you, Troy, and thank you again for joining us this evening. We are so thrilled to have your stunning exhibition, Sonda, at Linden, and I'm looking forward to finding out more about that. But um, I thought what we might start with is um, by looking through some of your um, previous work and projects uh, to get some background about the work that you've created for Linden. So I'm going to bring up some of the images that we have um, of your, your past work. Um, and we're starting um, with some of the, the gorgeous window displays that were part of Melbourne Fashion Week. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit um, about some of these displays. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. I have, uh, although I, I kind of usually exhibit in the, the standard a uh, white box of, of a kind of a fine art gallery. Um, I have been invited to collaborate with some kind of fashion um, projects um, to place basically to just uh, place my work alongside kind of uh, 
fashion in a kind of window window display uh, setup. And I think it works. Yeah, I think it works quite well because I think you know working with textiles, there's that definite um, uh, relationship between the, the these textile sculptures and and textile kind of um, garments and and things like that. And yeah, it's always interesting. I'm, I mean, fashion. I'm very kind of inspired by fashion. It's an area of study that I kind of started, uh, you know, I, I thought I wanted to study fashion, but uh, I, uh, yeah, it didn't really work out. It wasn't exactly what I wanted to do, but I, yeah, I studied fashion briefly. Um, and it's led, you know, it's funny that like all these years later, I've kind of come back and started being able to collaborate with some fashion. The, the main components we're seeing in these images is, is works with um, Hermes, the 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 French um, kind of uh, luxury goods uh, clothing brand, and mm -hmm. they um, they have a Sydney team who do their kind of uh, Australia wide um, store designs and things, and they you know they always work with with kind of artists and just placing uh, kind of you know contemporary art like within the space so alongside the pieces. They're, they're not really like installations. This is just my work, um, my regular work that comes out of the studio. And they were they were happy enough to to kind of place them temporarily on display. And, um, you know, they really do a very high level of kind of install. Um, they all do these kind of custom shelving and custom like fit out. So it was a real, real privilege to kind of have the work kind of displayed that like that, and I think yeah, there's this um, funny relationship with these small textile objects, both the kind of bags and and the and the sculptures of mine. Uh, yeah. So Hermes, yeah, I've worked with them kind of uh, three times or so. Um, the Sydney store, the uh, Melbourne stores. And um, the other image we had in there was was Melbourne Fashion Week. So that was a, um, mm. uh, that was separate from Hermes, and that was with a with a um, a designer from a Moth Projects Moth Designs, um, and they had a space in um, right in the city, just near the uh, near City Hall. Um, near the town town council offices, they had a kind of window space, and um, again, I kind of just loaned them my work, my regular work from the studio. They, these weren't kind of I mean, when I say that, I'm not. These weren't kind of commissioned pieces or, or specific collaborative pieces. This is just kind of um, from my from my body of, of available works that I that I had. Um, yeah. to kind of place them in the space and have this kind of relationship between the, the kind of other objects in there. I think they look amazing. And I was wondering, in fact, if um, some of them had been specifically chosen for, for, the, for the design. I mean, this one particularly, you know, the very colourful one with those bags just, uh, just sets them off, you know, both, both ways. It just looks fantastic. So this, this was actually quite by chance. You didn't select which works went into the window. Well, th there was a bit of a kind of um, a discussion with the kind of the the creative um, person behind the the whole shop window project um, mm. at Hermes. So mm. they kind of had a. I mean, what the best part about working with them was that they're just like you know just give us whatever you want. They're very very like open to to just yeah. being happy to loan the work. So. We just it was a, just a kind of a discussion of kind of what was going to fit um, in terms of size and things like that because you're quite limited in um, in depth of, of space and things need to kind of sit safely and and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But um, yeah. yeah, they they very much kind of like build the the install around the around the sculptures and things. So we saw that with the pink, the all pink room um, that was at. Uh, this one here that's in um, in Melbourne at the Chadston uh, Shopping Centre mm. and the Hermes store there. And that was really just my pink that I, I use um, yeah. and loaning them the works. And then they kind of like 
developed the the pink of the space and the um the other bits and pieces so Mm -hmm. yeah really it's just uh it's just interesting to see the work in a different context i suppose and uh, people a different audience as well um taking it out of that kind of fine art space um I think, I mean, there's a lot of like window display that is, that kind of tries to, I don't know, imitate fine art or like is, um, you know, a very kind of temporary disposable like display. But with this company, they're, they're particularly working with artists and like loaning kind of r- real pieces and, and things like that. So, I, yeah, that's I, I was a really great um, kind of relationship to, to, to show the work like this. Oh yeah, it just works so well, um, and clearly your your work um, it uses uh, materials that might often be more associated with fashion and textiles. Um, so I was going to ask you, um, I suppose you know you mentioned that you did study fashion, but um, what what is it that attracts you to to using those kinds of materials? And maybe when when did you start using those materials in in your practice? Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely um, interested in the kind of um, I don't know, maybe the industry of the the hobby craft world. Um, mm. These mass-produced materials that are that are really for little decorative projects. Um, I think that I, it kind of started working with. Um, well, v- before I. When I was, you know, back as in art school, basically, like I was doing these little kind of beaded hand sewn kind of things. And um, then I kind of scaled those up and I replaced the beads with pom poms, like machine, machine made um, chenille pom poms. Mm. And just looking at them as a material, they're like this mass produced machine made, made in. Uh, you know, made in these kind of uh, big Chinese craft material factories. And I just found them like the the way we use them is often kind of restrained or uh, where they're just like produced in such bulk and in such like variety and the colours are all really kind of bright and um, the materials are kind of cheap as well. Um, So I think there's, I don't know, I've always been, there's this whole theme in my work of this kind of like, I don't know, the these perceived notions of kind of fine art and um, uh, the kind of institutionalization of, of, of fine art and history objects, and then maybe in a way turning that on its head. So kind of revel in, in using these really cheap, tacky, uh, factory made materials it kind of turns that idea of the you know marble and um you know resin and you know using these kind of historically technical sculptural materials and trying to find something that is that is the opposite of that in a way um mm-hmm. so the yeah the these these are uh, materials like pom-poms and tinsel and tassels um I just find like just the the luggage that comes with those objects, I suppose, as these kind of mass-produced craft materials, an interesting kind of theme to bring into the work. Like you can bring in these, um, I don't know, the ma- mass-produced taste or mass, there's something weird about it, like these mass-produced poor taste because they're always quite like cheap and really colourful and maybe a bit garish. So... Um, I think in the world of fashion as well, I, not in the world of fashion, when I was studying fashion, I, the notion of kind of going to those kind of stores, like your Spotlight and your Lingcraft and your more specialty stores, just as a site of exploring for for bits and pieces and materials, I really kind of found all these like really great, interesting things that aren't really that you well that are used yeah i mean there's lots of artists that use all sorts of materials but i think the those those uh materials have a maybe a designated use that isn't always like includes the world of of fine art and and sculpture 
Yeah, it's so interesting how some materials are just seen to be less highbrow sometimes. Um, and yeah. I know that your work um, really often plays on this distinction between art and craft, and maybe this idea that um, if something's seen as as decorative, that somehow it's not taken as seriously in the art yes. world. Um, and this is really, your work really challenges these ideas, I think. Um, I was interested to know, you know, if you if you heard of your work being described as as decorative, um, how, how would you feel about that that term? In fact, is that oh, something yeah. you would welcome? I think it well, it of like I think it, it can be decorative, and there's a there's a handoff right where the artist makes the work with all their you know dedication and and com and convictions of their their kind of you know, uh, the themes in their work. And then, then, then it's the work is kind of handed off, you know, maybe to the the gallery space where it, where it becomes this kind of display and this decorative experience. And then there's another handoff where it kind of goes into the, maybe the, the private home or the personal space and it, it gets placed, you know, um, decoratively. Uh, I think animal, you know, that... I'm only interested in that. That's a kind of extension of an idea in my work. This, these kind of animal forms, they kind of do. Animals are kind of in visual culture, maybe, you know, definitely an icon of kind of de decoration. And, um, mm -hmm. and there's a, you know, a, even an idea that kind of like, you know, pets, you know, they, they decorate the home. Um, these like designer, you know, designer pets, and and even animals often are this kind of um, ecological lesson, I suppose. You know, like all the endangered animals, we have to look at them and Ooh. learn about how endangered they are. But it's also this very much like aesthetic experience. You know, the zoo is like beautifully landscaped with Ooh. you know uh, a whole range of things. It's not purely a utilitarian animal display device. It's kind of like a going to the park, a nice place to have a picnic kind of thing. Um, so these, yeah, these animal animals being, you know, these aesthetic experiences of things, you know, all the things that we take for granted when looking at artwork, I suppose, that it's just supposed to be there to be looked at and enjoyed enjoyed in harmony with kind of the other things around it. Like, you know, that's, those those are kind of rules that are placed on onto other things too. Um, like in you know, like in the animal world, like the Natural History Museum and the zoo and places like that, and in the home as well. Yeah. Oh, that makes me look at these shop windows in a completely different way now. I'm looking at them like zoo enclosures with all. Yeah, of the, yeah. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. like kind of uh, taxidermy. Like they, yeah, they're like the kind of Natural History Museum dioramas in a way, like a really pared down version of of that. Mm. And well, here we can see your work in in the you know very different context, as you mentioned, the kind of more white cube um, context uh, in the gallery space. Um, can you tell us uh, where where this show is and a little bit more about the works in this show? Yeah, yeah. This is Martin Brown Contemporary. They're a, a gallery in Sydney that I exhibit with, and this show was. Uh, last year during Melbourne lockdown. So I was uh, finishing the work off, sending it up, um, and the show was opening, opening in, um, within the confines of, like, uh, Sydney's lockdown and, and restrictions. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I was unable to attend. So that, it was interesting to... It was great to do get something done and be productive kind of during lockdown. So this this is kind of the results. And um, mm. it's, uh, you know, a suite of sculptures. I also have a like a suite of paintings uh, in that same show. You just jump to it. Yeah. So I do paint <laughs> kind of yeah. um, as a secondary line of inquiry um, in my practice, um, my paintings and sculptures don't necessarily mirror each other, but um, there's definitely themes of kind of uh, animals and, and colour and decorative arts um, in there, maybe not so much textiles. 
but mm. I think the texture of the the paint is I it's all very uh, straight out of the tube and with palette knives. There's um, so I'm very sculptural when I'm mm. painting. Um, mm. I'm kind of they're almost like two two dimensional sculptures. Uh, so yeah, the way to the explore kind of color and and similar themes. So I was able to show the the big suite of paintings and the um, and the sculptures together in Sydney, kind of um, occupying the same space. Yeah, I think these paintings just demonstrate so clearly your kind of really finely tuned, amazing sense of colour. Um, and it's with the sculptural works as well. It's it's a, a really important part of the works. I was I was wondering how you go about choosing the colours of the of the sculptural works because they have such a I mean for me at least have a, a very kind of the colour of them has such an emotional impact when you're looking at them. Um, I was wondering if you might um, tell us a little bit more about um, your use of colour. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think that definitely like all my works are kind of very colourful um, and I'm very much attracted to these kind of like intense full on colors. I also, also with my work, um, you know, I, I, it's all really about begins with the kind of materials and the collecting of the materials. And there is a kind of a, a limitation imposed on, on myself working that way with just what colors are available within the kind of, um, you know, it's not like I can just make a work any colour of the Pantone spectrum. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of like mm -hmm. these factories produce, you know, their 32 standard colours. And I find it really interesting, work, like just working within the confines of the what's available um, mm -hmm. and trying to push that. I suppose, you know, this, this material is, I think, you know, outside of my practice, often used quite sparingly, maybe as a trim on something, or yeah. um, and maybe a intense color is okay there. But I like this idea of taking that and using it in such you know these these sculptures have meters and meters and meters of of fabric in them, um, and there's something a bit crazy about using that in that kind of excess that you know this cheap color intense blue polyester used in the kind of you know uh dozens and dozens and dozens of, of meterage um i yeah. think creates a kind of chaos or something in the in the work yeah it's so fantastic. I mean, here's another amazing example of a uh, use of colour, but this time, um, this was uh, quite site specific. It's at the Art Gallery of Ballarat, and it was um, referencing the, the history of the area um, relating to the gold rush, I believe. Yeah. So, um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how your works um, fit into that theme of, of the gold and, and that, that area, how that came Yeah, about. it's a bit of a pun with the, the 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 term and it was um it was a discussion i had with uh louise taggart the the director of our uh, new recently um um director of art gallery of uh, ballarat who invited me to exhibit there um early it was that was like january february last year i think um and the the idea was that we were looking at their um, decorative arts collection, all those kind of like um, Toby jugs and ceramic animals and things. Yeah, yes. And the discussion was that those kind of things are, are kind of considered quite like uncool now in in art gallery collections. The, you know, all all our big institutions and regional galleries they're, they're just full of this stuff their basements would just you know have all these kind of um little decorative horse ceramics and and things i'm sure they're very you know some of them are very valuable and very significant within the the, the landscape of of that um genre of of object 
but they're they're not really displayed maybe as much or as regularly lately. So that that was mm. the 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 basis of the exhibition was to go into their dungeons, their <laughs> basement, <laughs> and bring out these like these little uh, uncool decorative animals. So the uh, the gold rush is uh, after the gold rush. The title of the show is more really about like after the period of of those kind of things being in fashion, and now that they're hidden away, um, we got them back out, and we found all sorts of, and then like there's this pun because like, um, you know, we Ballarat is a gold rush town, and there's a you know um, there's this. Uh, idea that it was built, you know, on this kind of wealth of, of the gold rush and it's a bit of a, like, it's not a dead town uh, by any means, but it's, uh, mm. you know, definitely the wealth and industry of the gold rush is, is long gone. Um, and so these, we just had all these kind of gold puns. So we managed to find a, a, a an artificial, uh, what's the word for artificial, like a, Im imitation uh -huh. gold nugget um, in the collection and a real gold nugget. Mm -hmm. And um, these are uh, these beautiful kind of like uh, etchings of kind of from gold, gold, gold fields of the gold fields. And then oh. I had my kind of gold animal sculpture. So, you, you know, your classic kind of European gold, gold lion of, you know, the Versailles Palace perhaps is mm -hmm. now rendered in polyester. Um, <laughs> so there's yep. a, and we, um, it was just an explore, you know, a play on the, on words really, then just pushing, pushing that idea. Um, so it's really great to go down to Ballarat, um, go through the archives, looking at all their like bits and pieces. We had, we had all the um, ceramic animals in these big old display cases and some of the work, crossing over so we had a gold room like gold so the walls were painted gold and the sculptures were all gold and then we had this you know this archive of treasures from the from the basement um all these kind of um figurines and things that um yeah were, were i love that back. i love that um further play on the the kind of materials and the you know how gold would have obviously been a, just an incredibly valuable material to have made a sculpture from, and, and the yeah. kind of contrast between using using your tassels for for more gold sculptures. It's fantastic. I, th um, I suppose there's yeah. these that like these ideas of value in in art and within kind of craft and within kind of decorative objects, and I think yeah, this. Um, Decided these objects being like lo losing their kind of like cool, cool value over time because tastes have changed. But you know, it's yeah, mm -hmm. it's an interesting kind of economy of of collections. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting to explore. Oh, definitely. Um, thank you so much for um, letting us know a bit more about what you've been up to up until this point. Um, I'm keen to talk about um, the show that you have here at Linden at the moment. Um, I'm wondering if we have some images of that or if we can see some of the show. i um, going to move some things around. Um, but the, the oh, yeah. title of the exhibition um, is very interesting in and of itself. And I'm so happy to know the meaning of this word because it was a new word for me. Um, the word sonda. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the meaning of that word. Yeah, yeah. It's a word I, I was just uh, I was reading this article about um, this kind of an artist, um, uh, like an encyclopedia of of new new words or words for um, concepts that have uh, co concepts that didn't have words for them and and um, sonda is a kind of a word, an emotion or a feeling that um, other people's lives strangers their lives are as complex as your own life even though you will never maybe meet that person or never maybe participate in, in their life. 
Um, and I just find that a really interesting term, I suppose, with making these sculptures that people so often um, project life onto or Im imagine what, you know, what they are or what they're doing. Um, and I think as, you know, with my own making of them, I'm often like, there's this, I don't, uh, like I, I suppose this almost like science fiction, fantasy, parallel universe, like where are these things from? What is the what is the universe where these things live in an environment or, or you know, move around and things? So this idea of, yeah, like being aware of that you're unaware of something is an interesting uh, concept, for, especially for these kind of like uh, slightly abstract slightly unsure of themselves uh, kind of uh, f figures of possible animals, possible other th other things. Um, yeah. Uh, I was looking into the dictionary that you mentioned. It's, um, it's an, an online project um, started in 2012 by uh, John Koenig, um, the yes. Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. Um, and Sonder, I was looking into it um it's <clears throat> inspired by the the german word sonder which means special and the french word sonder which means to probe so it's like you're trying to you're trying to investigate or find out something more about something very precious or special which i suppose is you know that is how other other people's consciousness or internal world you could see it in that way Yes, thank you very much for fully crediting the source. <laughs> <laughs> I did know that, but I just didn't have it off on the top of my tip of my oh, tongue. Of course. Um, I've got so into it. Um, I was going to actually give people some more examples of words from that dictionary. Because yeah, it's a very interesting project, yeah. and I highly recommend mm. people kind of look it up. There's lots of, you know, there's all that whole idea that um, this is probably a bit off track, but, yeah, you know, when other, other languages have words for, for concepts that that we don't have a word for. I always find that really beautiful. Yes. Um, and so many of the words in this dictionary sort of have a, a poignant quality to them. There's there's one word, um, exulansis, and apparently this is the tendency to give up trying to talk about an experience because people are unable to relate to it. Ah. Um, I know. I've um, felt that a few times. <laughs> Definitely. All of these words in the dictionary are very, very relatable things very often. Um, but I did wonder if it was that sort of poignant quality to the dictionary that um, that attracted you to it for, for the title of the show. Because I do feel like um, often the feeling I get from your work, works is, is despite the vibrance, um, is this sort of almost sadness or poignant quality to them? Is that deliberate? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, so my work very, I'm very much um, the core kind of inspiration for my my practice of these kind of fabric sculptures is uh, is like the taxidermy, um, which is kind of a, can be quite a somber like object if you if you really unpack it. it it's a, it's the pelt of a dead, dead animal, often an extinct or endangered animal, um, very far from, where it belongs. And uh, my work, although it does not contain any uh, animal components in terms of leather or fur or anything like that, um, it's very much a, a similar to the, the process where you're taking a kind of form. You know, it used to be sawdust. It's now high-density foam. And um, and you're pulling the, you're kind of putting the pelt over it and creating this this kind of semi-living uh, new new creature. And uh, I think uh, a lot of people, they may be a mistake in that there's a real animal inside, like that this is like a dead cat with covered in pink tassels or something, or that, um, that yeah, that this, it's, it's almost like, um, yeah, you natural, we naturally do this with animal forms. We kind of project these feelings onto them. And I suppose when you when these animal forms are, are covered up in, in bulk, I sometimes see them as um, you see the news stories 
about a, a wild sheep that was never shorn and you know it's like it can barely move because it's like stuck under this um overgrown pelt or maybe a you know some kind of unfortunate dog that was never been clippered and is covered in mats or something so there's some kind of almost idea of suffering under its the weight of its own pelt in a sense so there's yeah this kind of mm-hmm. empathy you have for these objects this idea of having uh, empathic connections with things outside of yourself you know be that strangers on the street S- sonder or you're an object in a gallery or, or something like that there's that like realization of something out- outside of yourself i suppose um absolutely and they have they really do for um i think they have this anthropomorphic quality whereby some of them i feel like it could be a human crouched down um some of them definitely definitely appear to be that way and it's it is it's the fact that the tassels you know have that um they disguise so much of what is underneath and I think one of the one of the important things that is disguised or somehow you know missing from the, the the sculptures as well is of course any facial features. So it makes it quite you know it's a challenge to kind of determine what the emotion might be of the of the animal or the human. Um, was that was that always a component of the work that the the face was so because it's such an important part of you know reading somebody else's intentions in a way or yeah yeah well all the features are there like the 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 interior form is kind of anatomically correct and quite detailed Mm. but it disappears through the kind of process of making the work and i do like pushing that that line of how far it maybe disappears. I think with a pink one on the right there, you get a oh, maybe yeah. this more abstracted form um, mm. where it kind of just be, is like a lump, but um, but underneath is a is like a quite a um, quite a, a accurate representation of a kind of cat kind of form, like in a you know in a mannequin core shape kind of thing but um but it completely disappears so you, you yeah i suppose it's that's maybe a bit of the magician's trick behind the curtain kind of thing is like i i know what's underneath but the audience doesn't really but you can still get a sense of it just through the silhouette um and through the way that's the fabric right. like uh either defines the form or or, or hides the form Mm, it very much still has a sense that it's a living thing under there, um, for sure. Um, I had another thought about the, you know, this this idea of sonda and um, it being about the realization that other living things have this complex inner world. And given that the the sculptures themselves do have that um, anthropomorphic quality of being you know perhaps human perhaps animal maybe you're not you're not kind of sure what kind of animal it is um i wondered if part of your intention with it was to sort of draw a parallel between the way animals think and the way humans think and maybe the capacity of animal for animals to have potentially as complex a inner world as we do as well but that we wouldn't know about it are there, yes. are there some of your <laughs> Well, yeah, maybe, yeah, kind of. The um, I suppose in a, I mean, I'm always asking my partner about my cat, and I'm I'm saying, you know, what what did she do today, and um, does she know what day it is, and always questioning um, maybe my pet's level of self awareness, um, and yeah. Uh, Yeah, these pieces, you know, I I suppose any conversation around these kind of objects is, you know, inevitably people will, animals are just so loaded, like people are like, oh, that's my, that's my neighbor's dog. Or like, (laughs) oh, you know, uh, wouldn't it, you know, this, um, they, you know, imagining what they are and what, what's underneath and stuff like that. I think... Yeah, they be, they become these kind of shadows of 
of an idea of something else. So you, you very quickly can, can start imagining um, behaviors and, and histories of these objects, which I think is interesting. Totally. And then there's, um, there's another sort of layer of meaning, and I guess um, maybe this is intentional, but I've been thinking about the titles of the works as well, which yeah. kind of take people, I think, into a very particular, um, maybe emotive state as well. So I'm, I'm just going to read some of them out. So that the really large, colourful one is called The Last Thing You See. I mean, oh. Yes. It couldn't be. That's <laughs> that kind of horror. I listen idea. to a lot of true crime <laughs> on when I'm working. Yeah. Podcasts. And then some of the others are called um, All I Think About, um, Can't Make Me Happy, and Things Could Be Worse. Yeah, um, so I think, be. you know, these are, these are phrases that, um, you know, will be familiar to most of us and that most of us have sort of had these thoughts at some point and then to to relate them to the forms of these creatures. It's um, it's a very kind of complex web of, um, I guess, projecting your own feelings and trying to figure out what's going on for the, the creatures themselves. Um, I was interested to know with, uh, where you find the, the titles and do you, do you kind of gather these generally or do you see the works when they're finished and they're just... They're, when they're, they're, they're finished or, and hmm. I suppose... Yeah, like my titles, um, um, I just kind of pluck a title <laughs> uh, out of maybe a song I was listening to or you know, a podcast I was listening to or a book or I was reading. Um, mm. But something, yeah, I, I think there's this idea of not giving them too lovely kind of titles because it is, I think, um, yeah, there is a kind of, for me anyway, and there's a kind of creepiness about them, maybe a bit of a spookiness, like with that, yeah, that mysterious creature hiding underneath and that these are maybe some kind of fantasy creature or some kind of dreamlike creature, some kind of vision. Um, so, yeah, I suppose titles that kind of take you just a little bit out of the, just the kind of, oh, it's a nice pink dog kind of <laughs> feeling where maybe, yeah, there's more um, yeah. that you can maybe feel if you're looking at mm. them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm looking at the time and thinking we should try oh. and um, answer some other questions that have come in as well. Um, somebody has asked um, about the... Um, how you get your fabric in such you know quantities and if it's um uh i guess how how much does it somebody said how much does all that fabric cost and do you buy it in big bulk quantities yeah yeah a lot of my practice is is kind of hoarding materials in it mm -hmm. and the works do have a lot a lot of of fabric in them i don't like uh, the fabric is is actually quite thin and narrow it's like a ribbon, basically, and it's mm. in bulk, in bulk. So I do, and again, I, I like the idea of these kind of factory-made, mass-produced materials that are bought di direct, often direct from supplier wholesale. So I'm like ordering in, you know, these huge pallets of, of pink tassels and um, things I remember I used to work in pom-poms uh, the chenille pom-poms and you know I I ordered like 22 boxes and it was like something like 280,000 pom-poms in one order it was this huge palette that like took up my whole studio and there's just something crazy I think about that when you think of them just um as maybe decorating a little frill on a dance dress or something like that where you're taking yeah. you know you may be using 15 or something in one project to then using you know a hundred thousand of them um the work the the materials yeah they can be quite expensive um and i think there's something about um it's not a material i can really make from scratch but i yeah very very um I suppose part of the luggage of the work is, yeah, using these like mass-produced 
kind of craft materials. So I do I do buy them kind of yeah in in really large quantities um, and um, wholesale input import them in. Um, and there's a whole world like in there's a whole world of kind of uh, craft factories and their catalogs and these I mean in in China where a lot of this material is produced, it's very common for like a whole town to be, you know, the the tinsel making town where all the tinsel factories are. And um, you just have these, you know, huge villages of of kind of tinsel tinsel production. And yeah, this it's very it's you know, if you contrast that to this, you know, this, the selecting the the right bronze or or something from a from a particular foundry um yeah there's this kind of ironic parody of that kind of tradition in a way in the choice of my materials i think yes absolutely um i was wondering um if you could tell us a little bit about i know you, you're working on a few um very diverse in fact uh, interesting projects at the moment um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about um, the work you've been doing with the Australian Tapestry Workshop. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just there today, actually, and uh, very uh, kindly funded yeah, project you. by uh, a project called Weaving Futures, um, funded by uh, Creative Victoria and an organisation called uh, Play King. Um, they have funded the Australian Tapestry Workshop to, it's, it was kind of like a COVID support project. So they, they are producing a, a number of small tapestries by uh, artists and the artists um, were asked to uh, submit a, a design um, and the Tapestry Workshop was then uh, to take that design, um, pay the artist a fee as part of the kind of funding process and produce the tapestry uh, on a smaller scale and then they can sell the tapestry as another fundraising kind of uh, scheme. So it kind of keeps the wheels of the tapestry workshop rolling, so to speak, um, during during a difficult time because the tapestries, I, as I highly recommend everyone visiting the Australian Tapestry Workshop in South Melbourne, they do handmade fine art tapestries um you know absolutely amazing these are kind of world class in the ngv in the great hall the big tapestries um roger kemp i think they are australian tapestry workshop um yeah so these big kind of fine art world class amazing handmade tapestries and to have them working on you know, taking little my my <laughs> silly old painting and and uh, producing it as a tapestry, it, yeah, it's quite amazing. So I saw it today. It's about three quarters finished. This image here is not the actual design, but it's, it's very similar. So they're working on a painting, mm -hmm. an urn style painting of mine, and um, I think the finished tapestries will be exhibited. They have a little gallery space there as well. So the finished tapestries will be exhibited in a few weeks, I think, when they're all all finished. Um, so, and again, you know, to, to work in textiles and to cross over to painting and then to have that painting shifted back over to textiles has been a very um, interesting and rewarding process. Oh, yeah, it'll be fantastic to see, to see it when it's finished. Um, and they will all be on display, yeah, at the Tapestry Workshop soon. Um, you also have a, a project, um, another uh, quite different project with Hermes, don't you? Um, not uh, shop windows this time, but producing other... Yeah, other yeah, just uh, collaborating them. with... They have a, um, like a, an in-house project um, called Petite H that use the materials, the kind of leftover recyclable materials um, from the manufacturing process of their, their core... Uh, products, all the kind of leather offcuts, silk offcuts, um, bits and pieces like that, and they they often kind of commission an artist to kind of 
uh, collaborate with them to design something using using those materials. So I've kind of been playing, workshopping an idea um, with them to use uh, some of their offcuts. I mean, it's again, it's a they're based in Paris, so it's a little difficult, like the long distance like project. But uh, yeah, it's really interesting. They it's it's something that um, I will um, conceptualize and then they will do the the labor and make the object over there. Mm. So it's a very, very kind of um, like a deconstructed <laughs> studio process. But yeah, again, um, it's interest, It's great to be working in a different field and context and new audiences and, and seeing the work in, in a different light. Mm. Yeah, I was wondering Troy, if you had a, a preference for how how your works are displayed, given that they they have been shown in so many different contexts. Do you do you prefer to see them in these more unusual um, display settings, or do you actually like the kind of white cube experience because it's you know it's, it's the very different ways of seeing the work? Do you? Uh... Yeah, I um, you know, it's just great to like just explore different modes of, of display I suppose mm -hmm. the I'm not like I'm not like a installation artist whatsoever I suppose these are these are all um, one um, these are all each piece is a kind of one-off interchangeable piece so um, displaying them together or displaying them alone or or integrating them into other other kind of contexts is all I think, viable ways of, of exhibiting the work. Mm. And you have some work going to Sydney? Uh, yeah, a show that. with uh, some new works for Martin Brown, contemporary, um, sometime uh, soon, later in the year, I think uh, end of May perhaps. And then there's Sydney Contemporary, which is an um, art fair in Sydney, which hopefully uh, goes ahead. I think it was cancelled last year. But... Um, that I think is later in the year, maybe September, October. So yeah, a few projects to kind of tick tick along with. Um, busy. Absolutely, and your show will be here on show at Linden until the sixteenth of May. Um, it's been fantastic to talk to you tonight, Troy. Thank you so much. Um, for your time and if you if you want to find out more about Troy Emery you can go to his website as well um, find out lots more about past projects I believe that that is appearing on the screen now um, for people to, to find out more um, it's just been such a pleasure thank you so much Troy and um, thank you for everybody um, for joining us tonight um, the next event in our Meet the Artist series will be a discussion with Ash Keating and that's on the 6th of May at 6pm so it would be great if you could all join us then. Um, otherwise thank you once again it's been wonderful chatting. Thank um, you very much. Have a good evening everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>